All right, here we go, OVE Podcast. Happy Thursday, everybody. Sometimes I forget the day of the week, but today uh, we are almost there. It's almost, it's almost, Sam, you're like, okay, it's it's almost Friday, but it's not payday Friday. So it's good, but not payday Friday good. Ohio versus everyone, the OVE Podcast, the Torg from QFM 96, Sam Grooms with us. We do everything Ohio, Buckeyes. We do Browns, Bengals, Blue Jackets, Cavs, Guardians, Reds, Buckeye hoops, and all the national stuff. Remember, we got a big basketball game tonight with the Buckeyes. Want you subscribe to our new YouTube channel? Want to get it going? We got a goal to get to 500 by tomorrow. We'll give another giveaway. We got a sports reward package for you just for subscribing to our YouTube channel. So it's youtube.com forward slash at Ohio versus everyone. That's going to be the channel we move to eventually. Still going to be on Menace to Sports, still with Menace to Sports, but we're going to move over to our own channel so we can do specialty shows and uh, give you a lot more content and do it, give it to you so it's available all the time. So we're now on Meta as well. If you're following us, remember those stars. Remember the Super Chats as well. If you want to throw some Super out Chats out there, if you want to tell Tony Alford to go to hell, hey, be my guest. All right. <laughs> so we're going to cover it all today. And if you're hurt at work or in an accident, let attorney Robert Sugar go to war for you. Remember, today is Thursday, so we'll do a little wrestling. We got some people into the wrestling conversation, so we'll do that the final segment of the show. And remember, just subscribe, like, follow, share. Do all the stuff you got to do. Let's bang and get those little fingers on the keyboards. What's up, Sam? What's going on, man? How are you? What's going on? I'm good. A little tired, but we're going to go. Get a little, little caffeine going. I'm looking out the window right now, and it does not look good. Little rainy out there. Oh boy, little uh, you know, like sometimes you can see the rain on like an office window or something. Yeah, the rain is across the window sideways right now. Nice. Don't worry, I got my internet plugged in, so we'll be good. Oh, yeah. We'll so if I drop off, it's because our electricity dropped out. Yeah, where are you at the office or at home today? Office. Oh, nice. Okay, there you go. You got good internet in the office though. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're I'm more worried about the power because we'll we'll have we've had surges in the past where you know you'll see a big old big old bolt of lightning and the power flickers and that would uh, that would that would cause me to drop off for a little bit. So if I just all of a sudden disappear, I didn't end it all. It's just yeah. You know, tell them power tell, issues. Tell everybody you're healthy. Everything you know. Yeah, we're not very happy. Not suicidal. Yeah, yeah. We should be good. Uh, yeah, man. So now that. Uh, well, I guess we'll jump into a poll question of the day. Uh, now that Tony Alford has, has turned trader, who's your least favorite Buckeye player or coach? And by the way, I also want to put a proposal to the chat that we change his name to Benedict Alford. Nice. Got to get some see see if that's uh see if that ends up sticking. You know, there's been a lot of of there's I spelled it wrong here, so. Uh... This is why you should type, Sam. Least favorite. You know, there's been a lot of Buckeye villains throughout the years. I mean, at one point, TP was like the ultimate villain, right? I mean, TP was a Buckeye villain. Everybody thought, you know, bailed on the program, got in trouble, didn't want to pay, uh, play. I think at one point, TP was a big Buckeye villain. For me, there's only one Buckeye villain, the ultimate villain. Uh, we don't need to go into it, Sam. It's easy for me when you're a pile of trash like that. But looking for the poll question, now that Tony Alford turned traitor, who's your least favorite Buckeye player or coach of all time? You know how dumb I am? I was just like, well, who? And then it ultimately hit me. Then you said pile of trash, and then I was like, oh, yeah. him. There's only one. <laughs> uh, Yeah, man. But, but uh, there's so guys like Maurice Claret at the time. I'm sure there's a lot of Buckeye fans. Yeah, and and who, I, he was one of the like he was Claret. Yeah, he was one of the names that I was going to bring up. And and when we were talking about this yesterday and, and Menace was talking about it as well, it's like, who, who who is going to come in and replace Alford, right? Yeah. And I keep seeing all these people talk about how Maurice Claret is 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 chirping or is tweeting at uh, at Ryan Day, like, hey, come give me – it's like, do, do people not remember how he left? Like, yeah. does, do, do people not still have a sour taste in, in their mouth after – what he did to the program and how he left. Like, I understand the guy maybe had some demons uh, post NFL career and, you know, paid his, his debt to society and he's gotten right. But like, let's also not forget what he did on the way out the door too. Oh, tried to burn it down. He tried to burn it down, man. 
He tried to burn it down. And years past, though, where I think we just forgive and go, okay, you know what? We forgive. It's a long time ago. He won a championship here. He did a lot. Water under the bridge. I think he kind of did a little rehab tour. Failed out in the NFL. I mean, his. did you ever see the Trussell boys, the 30 for 30? Yeah. I think a lot of people saw that and then became sympathetic to Maurice Claret a little bit. And time heals everything, too. And you know what also helps for all these guys? From TP to Maurice Claret to ever there's Ray Small that's been mentioned about the Buckeye villain. You know what heals all? A national title. And when Urban won a national title, it healed all. No, I, I and, and he all. was an, he was another name that I was going to throw up there, and I know it's probably an unpopular opinion, but like I understand what he was able to do as as a motivator of men and how he changed the culture, made it more SEC oriented, uh, the program that is getting coaches paid more. Like I see and I understand all of that, but to not have the intelligence to know that if you're in your own bar and you're going to go a couple neighbor, uh, a couple knuckles deep in somebody that's not your wife is probably a terrible look. And I understand he wasn't in a high state when he did that, but let's be real too. There are some, let's just call them rumors as to the first time he stepped away at Florida. And it wasn't necessarily all health issues that he didn't himself contribute to in some capacity. So I understand what he did and how he was able to turn the program around, but the guy as a as a human being is just disgusting to me. Yeah, I don't have again, any. Again, unpopular I think, opinion. Yeah, I think I kind of – if the thing is, though, if you know who the person is and accept the person for what they are, I think it, you find him a little less disgusting. You know what I mean? Because I think yeah. Urban, Sam, Urban as a person, it, it, he is who he is, and you get what you get, right? So I think when you're saying, oh, I think he's a disgusting person, I don't think he's trying to fool anyone, though. No, yeah. You know there's some, but there, you also have to, you know, they pe they preach credibility, they being, you know, coaches or Urban no, Meyer. He's a football coach, though. That's Urban the football coach. Yeah, but they preach they preach credibility to their players and not embarrassing yourself for the program, and then they go out and do it. So oh, I don't know, it, man. Oh, he just rubbed he's always rubbed me the wrong way. And, and again, what do you mean it, embarrassing it, the program? What are you talking about? For just him? some of the some of the crap that he he wasn't coaching college. Well, but when he was at Florida or when he was at Jacksonville, like again, I, the guy. I just again, the, I don't also want to be best friends with these people. I'm not going to act act like I am or. Mm -hmm. But I, I just there was always something about about Urban that rubbed me the wrong way in that regard. Yeah, I don't. Either way, I mean, I've interviewed Urban, met him a few times. I don't think he could pick me out of a lineup. Um, probably knows who I am, but I don't look at him that way. I look at Urban as a master manipulator, a great coach, a great recruiter, mm -hmm. a great leader in men as a football coach can get people to buy in on a program, on a theme, on a common goal to unite to win and as a human being i know stories but i don't there's a lot of like horrible like bad like as you what'd you say disgusting people or whatever yeah. i don't i think he is what he is so that really doesn't bug me i never looked at urban as like this shiny knight as a human being so i guess it just bugs me less than you see the thing that bugs me as a human being is a human being who is fake and a fraud and tries to, like, be the golden boy, right? And then behind the scenes, maybe he's um, having multiple affairs, right? Um, maybe trying to insert him thing, himself in things that he shouldn't do. Maybe he breaks the law, but because of who he is, they just kind of, like, maybe he gets taken to the police station and they just kind of call his wife and makes his wife pick him up the next morning. Uh, does he legal things that a average person would have serious problems with? Some illegal things, but he gets off and not reported because who he is. To me, that's a horrible person, a fake, a fraud. So those are kind of the people that I don't like. If we're talking about like character, I think that's a worse human being, someone who's a fraud, than someone urban because I think I know who he is. I'm not talking about anyone in particular. Well, I'm right, just saying it. And what, yeah, I think there is something to that. It's, it's, and I don't want to go political, so I won't, but when, when you have somebody that doesn't try to act like there's something else 
they pretty much, even if they're an asshole, but they, you know, come straight forward with it and you kind of know where they stand, like, hey, I'm all for that. And I'm, but it's still kind of the, the guy was just, he just always kind of, you just me don't like, way. you don't like Urban and you don't like his personality. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, that's, and then, yeah I think that's fair today, right? Yeah. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I Me, mean, we did the, we did the show a couple of weeks ago and it's a pretty good listen, folks. We said if Ryan Day stepped away, um, who would you want to take over the program? And I said, Urban Meyer, that was my pick because I want to win. And I know Urban's a winner. By the way, mm -hmm. I have some news uh, of Ryan Day. I think we're going to save it for tomorrow, though. It's going to be my big tease. It's something that we think of Ryan Day that might not be true if sure. um, they win a natty this year. I just got some interesting info, some good insight on Ryan uh, the other day. And I forgot all about it. And then I just thought about it. And I go, wow, that'd be great for the pod. And I think, well, but that'd be even better for a Friday when Sam and I do a solo cup Friday because every Friday from now on is a solo cup Friday. Oh, absolutely. So I, got, I got some Modelo cups <laughs> since I'm a crew, crew season ticket holder and that's the beer in Crew Stadium. I got some Modelo cups and we're going to be pounding them. And I got some good, you want to listen tomorrow because I have some legitimate good scoopage on Ryan Day that I think everybody will want to hear. And I think it's kind of one of those things where, man, I want to listen to the show or watch the show on Friday and see what Torg's got to say. And this isn't made up stuff. I know a lot of these message board people like to throw things at the wall and make up, make stuff up. And when they hit it, they're like, oh my God, look what I picked. And then you don't look at all the other stuff they miss. We are, we're like kind of like Carmelo Hayes. When we shoot, we don't miss if you're a wrestling fan, if you know what we're saying. You want to get into this uh, Tony Alford stuff, Sam? Yeah, sure, and then I'll, I'll reiterate what the uh, what the poll question was. Now that that Benedict Alford has turned trader, who's your least favorite Buckeye player or coach? We'll touch on that at the beginning of the second segment. I've got one more name that kind of struck me. Um, oh, okay. That I, that I want to bring up at that time, but uh, yeah, man. Like, obviously, I don't know that there's been a ton more information that's come down the pike on Alford leaving. I'm still trying to figure out. I obviously he he was able to sign a multi year contract. Um, still don't really know the terms of that. But uh, obviously, well, I, know, what I don't know, know what the, else he found. I don't know the money amount, Sam. I know it's like a three-year deal, deal compared to the one year he was getting here. So I think we do know that. Right. Um, just a couple of quick things. We had a someone who did the super chat, and remember, if you ask us super chat and we don't know, we will dig. You paid the money. I said I would dig for you and find out. And someone just asked, "Hey, why did why did Tony Alford uh, interview with Notre Dame in the first place?" And this is kind of what I found out, and I did some digging on this. And remember. There are two sides of this story, and you as the consumer, the fan, Buckeye fan, Michigan fan, whatever, even dopey Notre Dame fans out there or college football fans out there, you can kind of decide what you agree with, and there's no wrong answers in this. Me, personally, I don't like traders, and once you leave Ohio State, good, go, leave. I think it's great for the rivalry. Go and lose all the games that you're going to lose because Connor, Connor Stallions can't help you anymore, right? Um, but I could see why Tony Alford left. You know, we kind of hashed this up yesterday. You know, Bill O'Brien was given free reign to keep his assistants. Ryan Day told everybody, hey, it's Bill O'Brien's job. Parker Fleming and Corey Dennis were told, hey, we'll let you stay here for a while, but you got to find your own, you know, find your own gig out of here because you won't be coming back. We reported that on the pod. We even give you the days that they were going to be gone. And then Bill O'Brien came in and kept, you know, everybody that he kept. And then he leaves and Chip Kelly comes in and they hired their coach. And this is what we have now. Um, you know, but in November, after the Michigan game, Tony Alford interviewed with Notre Dame. We told you about that yesterday. We had a super chat where they said, why did he interview with Notre Dame? And I was told because he didn't want to coach with Ryan and he didn't want to be here long and short of it. He lost his passion. He lost his fire. Ryan didn't like the passion and fire, and that's why he got a one-year deal, because Ryan gave him a one-year prove-it deal. All right, you lost a little eye of the tiger. Get it back. We'll give you a one-year deal, and then when your contract's up, we'll see what happens after that. Just didn't like what was going on in that running, running back room, and that's Ryan's right to do that. Now, if you're Tony Alford and you feel disrespected because as a coach you were told, hey, you might not be back, I also get that, right? But you can't blame Ryan Day is if he's the head guy and you lost the fire a little bit and maybe you disagree with him, but sometimes your superiors kind of see everything and maybe you don't even realize you're doing it, but the perception was you were doing it. 
So well, let's let's look at it this way too. Like, obviously, it's it's college football. It's a it's a football program. At the end of the day, Ryan Day was Alford's boss. Yeah, and Ryan Day came to him as his boss and said, "I'm not really liking what I'm seeing right now. We we got to make some changes, or you got to go." Yep, that happens in every everyday life, right? Yeah. So I, I don't understand why that that's so out of out of the realm of possibility, or, or you know, even professionalism. Because it happens, it happens all the time. Yeah, and, and if you're Ryan Day too, and you're pissed off if after the Michigan game you interview with Notre Dame, and the thought was the Notre Dame running back coach was going to leave, and you know you interview because you don't like it here. Well, you don't like it here then, right? So why are you so ticked off that you only have a one year deal? And as we reported yesterday, when Ryan Day told the coaching staff, "Hey, your jobs are all up for grabs and up to the new offensive coordinator," Tony was going to leave then took a couple days to think about it and then decided to stay. The I guess the latest and I can't confirm this because when I asked about this I was told, yeah, don't, just don't buy into it. I don't think that's, you know, true. But there was stuff floated out there by the media and I'm not saying they're wrong, they could be right. There was stuff floated out there by different people saying that Tony Alford knew he was taking this job for 2 weeks, didn't announce it because they wanted to get as much info, the play Chip Kelly's playbook wanted to get the playbook, know what's going on. Remember, they're on spring break right now, so that's part of that. I mean, how much info are you getting? You only had two, what, two spring practices, Sam? So there's a thought out there, and people are reporting, and I'm not saying they're wrong, uh, that Tony Alford was knew he had the job, was waiting on the job for two weeks, didn't announce the job because he wanted to get as much info as possible. Uh, people that I talked to close to the program said, listen, how much info are you really going to get two days into spring practice? They don't dive deep into the playbook at this time anyway. Uh, a lot of playbooks are alike. Uh, you know, is he handing the playbook over to Sharon Moore? I doubt that. So I don't believe yeah, it. I, I don't. But I think it adds to the rivalry, doesn't it? If yeah, it, I mean, that, that true, sounds it like, adds to the rivalry. That that sounds like one of those pieces of lore that, like, you, you tell the stories and then the farther it gets down the line, the – the more ridiculous it gets as far as like outrageous. I, I don't come on. Like as, as much as I would want to believe that, like, I don't think that's what happened. I, I don't, I don't think he's running some kind of recon spy mission, knowing that he's going to Michigan for two weeks and trying to get as much info as he can. Like, yeah. And, I don't and, know. And when I talked to this person, cause I wanted to find out one, the super chat about, Hey, why did he interview at Notre Dame is cause he just was unhappy here. That was your answer. And then I said the same thing. Hey man, there's stuff online that he knew he was taking this job for a couple weeks now, but he hung around to get Intel and just kind of, I got one of these like, Dude, yeah, that seems a little, that seems a yeah. little outrageous for me, but, but I'm not, I'm not saying that it's not true. And I'm not yeah. saying any of these reporters are pulling, you know, doing bogus lines. I'm just, I don't think it. I think it's kind of a nothing burger. Yeah. Well, in let's my be mind, real. I hope it's co- real, so we can kind of get fuel to the fire. Let's be w- uh, real. Weirder shit in the last couple of years has happened. Yeah. Exactly. So, anyway, man. Well, listen, so, yeah, it, and, and ultimately, it's a running back coach who was a little disgruntled, and it was a little weird. You know how Ryan said, "Hey, we're going to let the offensive coordinator." And then guys knew they were going to get fired. Was the situation a little uncomfortable? Sure, I'm. I'm sure it was. Right. I mean, any I, I look at that whole situation, Sam, and we know it's true. I look at that whole situation as, man, yeah, that would make people uncomfortable. But I would think if you're a good coach, coach your ass off this year, win a natty, beat Michigan's ass, and then say, hey, Ryan Day, you brought me back. I did a great job. Show me the money. Let's go. And I think Absolutely. Ryan Day would go, yeah, well, you did do a good job this year. Let me show you the money. And again, like I, I thought about this a little bit more, and I've kind of come back to this, and I discussed it yesterday, man. It's like I understand why he left uh, more money, you know, some security, financial securities for right. his family. I completely understand it. But you had all these places you could have gone, and Buckeye Nation probably would have forgot about it in less than a week. But because you went to the arch rival, the nemesis, it's personal. And we're going to have to deal with that in some capacity. But do we know he could have gone elsewhere? Because we know he didn't get the Notre Dame job. You don't, right? you don't, well, what wasn't the reason he got the Notre Dame job because the running backs coach they thought was leaving ended up coming back. You don't think that Alfred could go get a job somewhere? Uh, no, maybe I think not he, this maybe, minute. Maybe he, I, I don't know. I, I think mean, he no, could. 
but it was kind of late, kind of right in the middle of the hiring period where coaches were doing their hiring. I mean, what options did you have, right, yeah. of, of coaching staffs of who was there? And I know sometimes guys will leave the fire. They'll do a roundtable. Alabama was hiring people, but I think that was already done at the time. So I think, you know, what was what was available from coaching, right? Michigan, Boston College. Yeah. Maybe there maybe there was a deal from Bill O'Brien that, hey, you don't take any of our assistant coaches. Remember we talked about that? Like, yeah. hey, what if Bill O'Brien comes here for two weeks and he likes a coach and takes him with him? I think maybe there was a gentleman's agreement there where like, hey, we're going to let you go be cool, but don't take any of our coaches. So there really he's, wasn't a lot of jobs open. He He's good enough, though, that if he were to put it out there that he was looking for a job, something would have happened. I think he did. That's why he's at Michigan, right? I don't yeah, mind that he's. I don't. Too. I don't mind that he's with Michigan because I think we're going to upgrade Sam. I think it builds to the rivalry. I absolutely love it. It's not like Chip Kelly's going to Michigan, right? Holy cow! Right. My house just rattled. Um, yeah, you know, and, <laughs> and did I not joke yesterday about hey, let's go take a team's head coach for the running back job? And then one of the names for the job, uh, rumored names, is Stan Drayton, who's the head coach at Temple. Temple. Yeah. I said, let's go. Let's just go and take a head coach, just like we did with Chip Kelly. Now, at, at this point, these are just kind of names that have been floating around. Scotty Graham, who's at uh, Washington, I believe, former Buckeye uh, running back. Deuce Staley, who's the running back coach with the Browns. I don't know why you would leave the Browns to go to. That's in the running back coach uh, Stump. Uh, Stump, what's his nuts? No, he got fired. Oh, did he? He got fired with Alex Van Pelt. Okay. No, that oh, that's right, the uh, beard guy. Big yes. gray beard. Yes. So I don't know why I do stay. I know he's got a relationship with Chip Kelly. I don't know why though. Uh, Demarco Murray's name's been mentioned. Uh, boy, wouldn't it? Stan Drayton's been here, been successful here. We take another head coach from a college football team. That'd be great, wouldn't it? <laughs> high state, the high state coaching staff collector oh, of heads. That would be the dream. You want to? Uh, you want to hit a, a break and we can jump into the NFL? Yeah, quick break. Something we told you that was going to happen yesterday almost happened, and it probably will next on the OVE podcast. We go to war for you. At Sugar Schnarr Trial Attorneys, we don't back down. Accident? Call us today at 877-WAR4U or visit warforyou.com for a free consultation. Know your rights because results matter. That's 877-WAR4U. 877-WAR4U. Or visit warforyou.com. War4U. Warforyou.com. Hazmat Ohio is a firefighter-owned and operated all-hazards training company specializing in custom safety training for your company's needs. They offer corporate CPR, AED first aid, confined space rescue standby, spill and emergency response, and they can train firefighters, industry safety teams, and employers. Call 740-507-8802. That's 740-507-8802. Thinking of buying or selling a home? Give Lauren Torgerson a call with Next Home Experience. Lauren has been servicing the Columbus metropolitan area for 10 years. So whether you're a first-time home buyer, considering building, want to upsize or downsize, Lauren can help you with all your real estate needs. Get a free market analysis for your area and get started working on making tomorrow's dreams happen today. Call or text Lauren at 614-296-3952. 614-296-3952 or email at torgersonlauren at gmail.com. OVE Podcast, The Torg, Sam Grooms. Ohio versus everyone wants you to subscribe to the new YouTube channel. Let's go to youtube.com forward slash at Ohio versus everybody. Just subscribe. We got a rewards program going almost to 500 subscribers. When we do, we will pick a subscriber and we will send you a CJ CJ Stroud rookie card. It's a nice one. Not a cheap, not one of those tops one. It's this one. Mint condition, right? Mint condition, brand new in the wrapper, really looks sharp. So Someone who subscribes to the new YouTube channel. If you're watching the Menace to Sports, flip over a little bit. Subscribe. You can flip back over and watch Menace to Sports. So if you want to get involved, let's say you want to get in the drawing like five times. Open up five YouTube accounts and subscribe. I don't care. Let's go. So I want to 
jump into the NFL stories here a little bit. We still have some free agency stuff going on. I uh, want to come back to the, the poll question discussion, but then also want to touch on Nick Saban uh, in front of Congress. We've had this on the show sheet a couple of days now, but then yeah, also how go, that kind of We can ties go a little long this segment too, yeah. Yeah, so uh, starting off, um, as we discussed yesterday, and I think I, I can't remember, Scott, if it was you or if it was your buddy brought up, what would it take uh, for the Bengals to go after uh, uh, Justin Jefferson with the Vikings? And we heard a or I saw a story yesterday that the Vikings declined two first round picks and T Higgins for Justin Jefferson. The Vikings said no. Also. Yeah. I would say I also read the story that Jefferson declined a $30 million per deal extension in t- sometime in 2023. Yeah, that's fact. He recently did that too. He went, he was going to be the highest paid running back in the league and he turned that down. So wide receiver, wide receiver, excuse me. So he turned that down. Justin Jefferson turned down the, you know, the salary to be the highest paid wide receiver in football or v- very close to it. Uh, also th- the way this, there was rumors about if you follow Twitter, Jamar Chase was tweeting stuff. They couldn't get a deal with Justin Jefferson. And why were the Bengals being so quiet about T. Higgins? T. Higgins came out and said, well, they tagged me, said they wanted to offer me a long-term deal. Then they haven't spoken to me. And then you are wondering, like, hey, why are the Bengals not spending very much money? You know, uh, Sheldon Rankins, I believe the defensive tackle from the Texans signed with them. I think that's official. So they have that uh, DJ readers in Detroit, I believe today. So I'm not sure maybe by this time, this podcast is on or we're doing it. Maybe he signed there. Not sure. The Bengals really don't like to sign guys as free agents over 30, but so you put two and two together and I contacted a, I contacted a former GM and I contacted like a a pro scout player personnel director guy. And I was just kind of discussing what would it take for the Minnesota Vikings to trade Justin Jefferson. Now the Vikings, have come out and said, we are not trading Justin Jefferson. But Justin Jefferson, folks, is going to ask to get traded. You do not stay with the team that has Sam Darnold as your quarterback and you're picking 11. Unless somehow the Vikings move up in the top three, Justin Jefferson is going to say, get me the hell out of here. But when I talk to the personnel director and then I talk to the GM just about it, GM didn't think they were going to make the deal. Just, yeah, I just don't think it happened. The personnel director said if they were going to trade Justin Jefferson, it's two first, T. Higgins, and that starts the conversation. Folks, they have just started talking. Sure, did the Vikings turn down that two first-round picks? Absolutely. All these personnel guys know kind of the market. We told you yesterday Joey Galloway was traded for two first-round picks. Justin Jefferson is the best weapon in the NFL. What Cincinnati's going to have to do to step up if they want Justin Jefferson, Sam, is they're going to have to float the three first-round picks, T. Higgins, for Justin Jefferson. And then if the Vikings still say no, I would fully expect Justin Jefferson to come out and say, I'm not signing a deal with you. Then once yeah, I mean, that's going to – Yeah, that's that going to be a the, great move. Yeah, that would take a lot of the, the, the Vikings' leverage away, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you got you have the franchise saying I'm not I'm not uh, trading you, and you have the player saying I want to trade. Like, yeah, then it's over. Once Justin Jefferson says, "Hey, I'm not re-upping with you. I'm never signing with you. I'll play one final season with you." What are the Minnesota Vikings going to do? And this is their fault. They created this because they had an opportunity to keep Kirk Cousins last year, and they did not. The Minnesota right. Vikings call. I'm a Vikings fan. The Moneyball GM was a disaster hiring him. He has had horrible drafts. And I, does anyone blame Justin Jefferson out there if he wanted out? Now, the Vikings fans are losing their minds, Sam. And what they're pointing out is that Minnesota has the third most salary cap next year. They have tons of dead money coming into the cap. And they are, I think the selling job Minnesota's doing to Justin Jefferson is, hey, man, we have $140 million to spend next year. If you stay... We're going to make you the highest paid receiver. We're going to draft a quarterback this year. And then we're going to have all this money to spend and bring guys in. And we're going to be a position to rebuild better than ever because no one's going to have as much money as we do. So it, it, the problem is, crazy? is, who are the quarterbacks throwing to him? It, am I crazy in holding this 
you know, holding this stance or having this opinion that three first round picks and a, a probably a one or a two starting probably. wide receiver yeah. right now, the only position that you would spend that kind of capital on is a quarterback. Yeah. Am I crazy Absolutely. in thinking that? Absolutely. I mean, three firsts, a player for just, I don't give a shit if it's Jesus Christ running routes. Like, well, I do because Jesus could take the ball, turn it into something after he scored, turn it into a, Jesus could score a touchdown, get in the end zone, turn it into a rocket and set the rocket off. Jesus, so I will it. say, I, I, Jesus has a phenomenal catch radius. Absolutely. Jesus, Absolutely. Runs in so it really doesn't matter who's throwing it to him, right? Yeah, he runs in sandals. <laughs> That's just, um, but Sam, that's way too much for a wide receiver. But, but even even a guy is probably the best think, wide receiver. I don't in the think league. so because Mike Brown's in his eighties. He's ready to take a dirt nap. And if you want to see a Super Bowl, would you say Sam, if Justin Jefferson goes to the Cincinnati Bengals with the moves they they made, right? And then they have a they have a Mikai Benton Becton in right now. Correct, he's in Cincinnati, and they get that signed up. There's your right tackle. Wouldn't you say with Justin Jefferson on that Cincinnati team, they're the front runner to go to the Super Bowl? Von your defense, still, ha- your defense still has to get better. Well, Substantially they, better. Okay. So they went out and got uh, Geno Stone. They went and got former captain Von Bell back. He's he's back with the team. Yeah, but he's and on the tail end of his tackle. career. Like as much as I like he's Von still Bell. still 29. That's ancient pretty much, in, unless you're playing quarterback. So you don't think they've done enough to be middle of the pack defensively? Because I know offensively they'll have the number one offense in football. They're, they're often, if, if that all transpires, yes. What I would say is this is if they make that trade, three first T. Higgins, okay? If you don't win a Super Bowl what, with this window open, you have now leveraged your future, and it's going to be the, the 90s, early 2000s Bengals all over again. I don't you, think that's so, I don't so think, much capital to give up for a wide receiver. I don't think so because you'll have Justin Jefferson long term. You have Jamar Chase long term. You'll have uh, three giant contracts. But three giant contracts. But three of the best guys in the NFL. Two of the best receivers in the NFL with the, one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. There's not been a name me out there. Someone out. I'm not looking at the chat right now, Sam. But has there been a better? If you had Burrow. Chase and Jefferson, who the uh, who is better quarterback wide receiver combo in the history of the league than those three guys? Who name me anyone? Because it's history of the league. History of the league. Don't give me Montana Rice and Taylor because Taylor isn't even close to what these two guys can bring. There is no one. uh, Bradshaw, Stallworth, and Swan. Come on, Terry Bradshaw. Overrated. He's there because of the rings. Mahomes, Cheetah, Kelsey. No, it's tight end. And no, I I don't know. Maybe that's tight end. But yeah, three weapons, but tight end. Yeah. And what did they do? What did they do? Somebody, Sam? This is a good one too. Somebody just put in the chat a DB good call. Cunningham, Moss, and Carter. No, because Cu- Cunningham was crap. Cunningham was the backup. Or not, who was a, Cunningham's uh, not, not even Cunningham. close hang to on, Joe Burrow. And I'm hang a on, Vikings hang. fan. I am a Vikings fan, and I'm telling you. Randall Cunningham was benched the next season. He's not even close to Joe Burrow. He was a one-hit was, wonder. Was uh, was Cole Pepper thrown to Moss and Carter at the same time? Yes, but Cole Pepper's not even close to Joe Burrow. You can't not even close. Why? Why have we crowned Joe Burrow? Because he got to uh, the freaking Bengals to the Super Bowl. Just uh, premature there, man. Like the guy's a great talent. Okay, Marino, Duper, and Clayton, good, close. But I still don't think to this level. I don't know if Duper and Clayton were the best at their position because I think Jerry Rice was around then, and I think yeah. Jerry Rice was the best, and I think Justin Jefferson's the best. Justin Jefferson's uh, the best receiver in football. Clayton and Duper were some of the best, but I don't think they were the best. So you, you've touched on this. I want to give us a little bit of time to discuss the NIL and uh, Nick Saban, but you discussed these topics already or, or kind of hit on this. Kai Becton visited the Bengals today. Uh, looks like you could fill your right tackle and or potentially left tackle need. Um, the Bengals closed on the contract with defensive lineman Sheldon Rankins. Von Bell returning to the Bengals as well in a one-year deal. Um, Joe Flacco signed a one-year deal with the Colts for $8.7 million. Yeah, there was a report it was Baltimore yesterday. Yeah. And that's kind of what the internet was saying, so we apologize on that. We We read the internet. That's what the internet said. And he signed a little less than he signed eight million bucks. Still a good deal. Yeah. 
Um, and then the last the kind of just recently came down before the show, and we don't know all the details yet, but both Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack have reworked their contracts. Uh, keeps them both in San Diego for the time being, and hope I, that should now get them underneath the salary cap so that they're not in any kind of violation of that when the uh, uh, the uh, new season opens up. Boy, who would have thunk, get- though? Who would have thunk, Sam, that the Chargers, they lose Ouchie Mike Williams, who's hurt, and they stay under the cap. And really, everybody's back except for Austin Eckler, who's north uh, 30 years old. And I tell you what, as much as I don't like Jim Harbaugh, onesie Jim Harbaugh, um, they're going to have a really good team next year. Yeah, I, they they could if they get it together, right? Yeah. Um, I'm still – I think Herbert's a tremendous talent. I still want to see him put it together. You know, he's one of those guys that everybody talks about, but he's never gotten it done either, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm impressed with how quickly he gets rid of the ball. I'm, I'm yeah. impressed with the ball. He's got a cannon. He's got an absolute howitzer attached to it. But, but I can't blame him because they had the biggest dipshit coach in NFL history. So that's why I can't kind of judge brutal. him. Uh, Brandon Staley is the worst head coach in the history of the league. Mr. Analytics and the in- analytics were always wrong. So we, we've talked about this and I want to touch this topic. Nick Saban goes in front of Congress is basically um, a, a, an expert witness about or against the NIL. Um, again, this has been on our show sheets. It's a couple of days old now, but I know we wanted to talk about it. I think you and I have a little differing opinions on this. However, you know, more or less says uh, the, the NIL is uh, part of the moral decay of the sport. It's going to take it down. Um Again, I think we maybe have a little different opinion here, but I'll let you run with it from there. Well, I think Saban was right about some of the things he was saying, and I think Congress is right too, where um, I think it was Ted Cruz says, hey, it's a 50-50 chance we change this. I I have done the research. I've talked to NIL people, people involved in NIL uh, the past two days, and this system is not going to stay. It's That's factual. It can't. You're right. There's no way. It's not going to stay. So one thing, let's get this perfectly straight. Nick Saban is really bitter. You know why he's bitter? Because Alabama was paying players and teams, other teams got to pay players and now he's not winning anymore. So let's just get that right out of the way. Nick and he's seeing, and he's probably, he's seeing a lot more of his wife now than he wanted to be right now. Absolutely. Nick Saban is pissed because they built the system where other teams could pay what he pays that right. Let's let's get that out of the way. But but the things that Nick Saban is saying is not wrong. If you Sam, if you, and I was talking about this last night to people with with uh, people involved in the program, a NIL guy. We were out last night. This is fact. You cannot tell me out there if Ohio State wins a national championship or comes close that those players aren't going to walk into Ryan's day Ryan Day's office and do the exact same thing the Alabama players did to Nick Saban. If you think they're not going to. You're wrong. You're flat out wrong. They are going to go to Ryan Day after this season and go, listen, I need more money. That's what Nick Saban's pointing out, Sam. Sam's pointing out what he's saying is after every successful season, these players are coming into the offices now and then saying, pay me the money. It got to a point, Sam, where you got coaches now calling people for money to support the NIL. When did you think that would happen? When did you think Gene Smith would call people and help to try to get money for this football team? Folks, this 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 system is not going to sustain itself. It's not. It's got two years max. Now, they're not going to get to it this year. They said 50-50 shot. It's going to be by the end of next season, they're going to put in a new system. And I am telling you, that is how long this is going to last. Two more years across the board. Now, the system they're going to put in, we we can we can get to it, Sam. I kind of have an idea of the system they're going to put in with a more revenue sharing plan with schools in the Big Ten and the SEC. I don't see any way in H-E double hockey sticks that the other conferences are going to survive after a few more seasons. But Sam, everything Nick Saban was saying was correct, but he's also a bitter old man because he's not the only one paying anymore. We need to. We may need to put a pin in this because I uh, I definitely want to get into this. But our fire alarm is going off in the office. I have to go check on that. So really, all my right, guy, well, you may have to. You're gonna have to fly solo for a couple minutes. All right, minutes, all right, I, all right. I, I'll fly. I'll fly solo. I'll be right back. All right. Um, you know, but but having this conversation last night, these this nil system, you say, oh, it's Columbus, Ohio. They have, they spent a lot of money on players this year. They went all in this year. When you have coaches. And the athletic director who didn't want to get involved 
calling now, trying to get support and trying to get money, this isn't going to end. And this is, and Nick Saban's right. This is happening everywhere. And the money's going to run out except for Texas. You just can't sustain what's going on. And so the system has to change and it's going to change. And it's going to take Congress, Sam, to everything all right? Yeah, everything okay? The thing just starts going off. Nobody knows of a fire drill. And the second I go out there pissed off, plugging my ears because it's so loud, it just shuts off. Yeah. And by the way, uh, the person who said on the chat isn't going anywhere. I talked to the people in the NIL. Yes, it is going somewhere. It's go- Con- it, there's- it is because yeah. Congress is getting rid of it. Do you know what's going on? They're having these hearings because they're going to have a new system. So so there, there's a couple of reasons why it's going away. One, you have the Big Ten and the SEC have essentially formed a super group. The NCAA is going to be irrelevant very soon, yes. right? Um, there is a tremendous amount of money in the sport, right? We all know yeah. that. Yep. But that does not mean that it's flowing through the NIL coffers to the players. So I, I, I understand why you may think that. But the, the system right now is not sustainable. Yeah. You know, these players are supposed to be getting paid for their name, image, likeness. So the money generated from their, again, NIL, their name, image, likeness, that's not as that's not at all what is happening. You have pay for play going on. And yes. and how close, how close are you do you think we are to a player going into his coach on a Friday or you know, whomever and saying, yeah, unless I get a you know a couple hundred thousand dollars, I'm not playing in the game tomorrow. Yeah. How close? How close do you think we are to that? I don't know. Could happen. I think we're this close. Yeah. This it, this current system. I, I don't want to sound like the the get off my lawn curmudgeon old guy, but like it's ruining the the college football landscape. You can't oh. put it. You can't put this genie back in the bottle. Now they're going to have to go the route and find out some way to do a revenue share to pay them as, as employees or what, whatever that basically means. That's where we're at. And that's the next step. The problem is now you're going to have Congress getting involved. And I don't know how much that's going to help. That's going to add an additional layer of problems. Yeah. Go, go ask, um, go ask the guys running the NIL, the 1870, the Brian Schottensteins, go ask them if they think this is going to last for 10 years, five years. It, it's not. It's not going to last. It's a pain in the ass. And people are asking for more and more and more. And I don't blame them. I don't care. You ask for whatever you want. It's the system. I'm just saying it's not going to last. It's not going to last at other schools either. It can't last. Now, the system we could talk to about another day. That You know, I was kind of floated a couple ideas. Everybody thinks because Dartmouth uh, unionized, that's a unionized system. I've told me not necessarily be the case where players, you know, are unionized or employees. So I think there's a lot of different systems they're floating out there, but take, make no mistake about it. When you talk to Congress and Congress says, we are going to come up with a solution of this deal. They are the government. The government screws everything up. Just remember words from the Torg. When the government gets involved with anything, they screw everything up. That's a fact. Look at everything government run from the BMV to the TSA. Government screws up everything, right? But the government's going to come in and give you one type of system, whether you like it or not. You know why? Because the NCAA was too incompetent to come up with a plan. So they laid it at Congress's feet and said, please help us. That's what they're doing right now. I think the other possible solution would be and, and I, I, I'm not a lawyer, and I don't even try to play one on TV, but if if these conferences come together and essentially form some form of supergroup, mm-hmm. they break away from the NCAA, and they're able to come up with their own rules, um, you know, to being involved in this, this supergroup that would somehow maybe cut out the need for Congress. I don't know, but that would take a lot of universities, a lot of programs coming to agreement and on who's getting paid what, and then you're going to get the the money in different networks involved. Like, it gets real hairy, but it would be a way for them to keep Congress out of it. But I just don't think they're going to go that route. No, they can't keep Congress, Congress out of it because the NCAA and the schools don't want anything to do with it. They're not tackling this right now, right? right. If right. they really wanted to get together, Sam, and come up with a solution, then the you know, that kind of SEC – Big Ten group that they have where they're talking about different things. I think they're talking about money, right? Um, yeah. 
it, it's just a system right now is it's going to change. If you think it's not going to change, it's not going to change this season and it's not going to change next season. But I think in season three, I think you're going to see some things change. Definitely. I mean, they talked about it yesterday, folks. Did you read the articles of what everybody said in that committee? They're going to change things. Now, it might not be the system anybody wants, but they're going to come up and they're going to change things. No, it's, the, the, again, it's unsustainable. Don't underestimate right power. Now. Don't yeah, underestimate it's, it's, people who are given power. Yeah, it's it's 100% entirely unsustainable at this route. And honestly, man, like, to, I, I've kind of changed my tune a little bit on pay, players getting paid. Mm-hmm. But anybody that's on that side of the argument or is on, you know, on that side with me, can you really say you're happy with where the, the sport is right now? I think I mean, if you're I'm a Buckeye not. fan, you can. I am because well, we're yeah, but I mean, let's be real. High State was kind of close to the, the the apex or top of that mountain already. Like, but still, like, you can't tell me that the the state of college football right now is better than it was five years ago. No, something's gonna get done, right? What it is, I don't know. There's different things we'll throw out here. Maybe we'll throw it out tomorrow. Um, something will get done. It just, yeah, the system sucks and it's gonna it's great right now for the Buckeyes because of what happened in the offseason, right, Sam? No one wants this system to change, but also no one's really done their homework of what's going on behind the scenes, yeah, right? Nobody wants to spend the time to fix it either. Yeah, I mean, these coaches don't want to be on the phones talking to people. You think Ryan Day wants to spend his day calling people? Oh, absolutely. Come not. on, he's like a fundraiser. Hey, it's you know, hey, you know, like people taking phones and make they don't want to do that. Come on. See, well, apparently my- these guys signed up for that. Our fire alarm was semi-serious. We've got two trucks pulling up into the uh, parking lot. All right, I tell you what, Sam. We're going to take a break. We come back. It's Thursday. We're going to do a little wrestling. We'll come back. We'll talk more about this tomorrow because people are involved. People are talking. We'll have more NFL stuff. Hey, maybe Justin Jefferson will be a Cincinnati Bengal tomorrow. Maybe. All right, OVE podcast up next. It's Thursday, our final segment. BJ Sugar is going to join me. A lot of stuff going on. It's almost WrestleMania season on the OBE podcast. And let me tell you about my guys at River Valley Restoration. If you have a project, I know it can be overwhelming. Let them take the stress out of it for you. Give them a call. And it doesn't matter if you've got a huge project, small project, or somewhere in between. They will take care of you. Free in-home consultation. They do roofing, siding, gutters, windows, doors, decks, attic insulation. I love that they do bathroom and kitchen remodeling. They can get pricey, but not at River Valley Restoration. The project manager is going to talk with you, work with you, picking the materials, picking out everything, taking you through the progress every step of the way, keeping you informed. I love that. At a price that you can afford and you know you're going to get a great job. 10-year workmanship warranty, double the industry standard, and a 50-year roofing warranty. They offer financing as well, 740 785-5000 785-5000 or at rivervalleyrestoration.com. If you're having an event, everybody needs to be safe. Medical emergencies can happen any place, anytime, anywhere to anyone. You have to be prepared. Event Medical Staffing of Ohio has highly trained medical staff. They provide life-saving care when needed. Basic and advanced life support care to events all across Ohio. Festivals, concerts, fairs, motorsports, any sport you can think of, including film and television. They provide training programs as well, including first aid and CPR. So give Event Medical Staffing of Ohio a call at 740-403-6739 or at eventmedstaffing.com. All right, OVE Podcast, what is up? Hey, hey, Torg. Long long week for Monday Night Raw today, huh? Yeah, BJ Sugar's joining us. Remember, warforyou.com, man. If you're hurt at work in an accident, he'll go to war for you just like Undertaker in a hell in a cell, baby. Hey, That's uh, right. let's, let's start off with something different because usually we start off WWE, and I apologize. I didn't send you the notes this week, but I'm, I'm keeping it very easy. Let's start because we didn't get to it very much last week. Okada debuting with AEW. Here's the, here's the problem I have. And we do a wrestling podcast, and maybe I should know, but I'm not following New Japan Pro Wrestling. I did not know that Okada was like the sting of New Japan Pro Wrestling. I don't know the history of these wrestlers. So Okada was this good guy throughout his career. I don't know how long he's been wrestling. That's the thing. I think the majority of wrestling fans knew who Okada is, know that he's a big deal, know that he's a great wrestler, know he's a champion over at New Japan Pro Wrestling, knew that he was a sought-after free agent that WWE wanted, 
AEW wanted. He was a wanted person. But to have him debut and turn bad when we didn't even know if he's good or bad, to me, BJ, to me, the common fan, they're making a big deal that Okada turned when I don't even know the majority of the fans. Would you say over 75% of the fans out there watching AEW probably didn't know he was a lifetime good guy and that this was like a shocking turn? What a horrible setup by Tony Khan for a reveal of could you not play the game for a you know, little bit longer before you ch- you turned him heel? It just paying, it, it yeah. was nothing. Well, I agree. And it comes back to the point that you've made in the past where the inside baseball piece takes over the narrative in AEW. Mm-hmm. The expectation that everybody already knows who Okada is um, uh, should not be the expectation. And when they did turn him loose, um, uh, you know, even as a heel, I I was not um, compelled. Uh, you know, he had the uh, um, he, you know, he had people speaking for him. Um, the way he came out, the way they kind of again even portrayed him as sort of a, within a group, and maybe that maybe that's because he's not good on the mic. They kind of uh, shielded him from that. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how quickly it, how the narrative develops around him because he is a superstar that Tony Khan is hanging a lot on now granted tony khan's bank is deep so even if he misses on this he'll move on to the next but uh i'm not the first show for me for okada was not uh, compelling it did not bring the fight the uh, mercedes monet brought more uh, heat and energy uh, in her opening uh, of that entire show that was probably the best thing that tony khan's done so far was uh, opening and closing with her on a show that i've seen in a while Yeah, I just didn't get it from a standpoint of if you're doing the Okada, even in the broadcast, BJ, shouldn't they tell me that he's one of the most loved, the most popular? They've got to build him up. Exactly. I mean, an announcer's job, Shivani, whoever, uh, Tony Shivani and and the crew, and he knows that. The job is to build up, to hype up the expectation of this new giant star that's coming in. Uh, Instead, it came out with a flat note. If you didn't even know who Okada was, you would just think that this was an, another face in the crowd that, that that's you know that's come on the scene. You have to build the talent up in order to build a narrative. I mean, they did more heat. They had more heat with Will Osprey's um, uh, segment than they did Okada and Okada's match. Yeah, I I just don't under from. Was there any like I don't even know the past between the young bucks who were like what they were in the Bullet Club between. The young, there had to be some type of past with Okada, right? With the, I don't know. No, it, some- it, 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 think about it. you and I, two big wrestling fans. We don't even know. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure how anybody, uh, it, unless you already are following New Japan wrestling, would even know. Yeah. I mean, Nick Nemeth went over there to wrestle in New Japan. We haven't heard from him since. So he might, he might be the world champ in New Japan, but that's not trickling over here to the, uh, um, to, to us, unless you're unless you're actively seeking it out, but if you want to build up AEW like we've talked about, you have got to spoon feed the fans. You've got to create the heat. You've got to build the narrative. You've got an asset here in Okada that you can really do that with, with an interesting, compelling. Yeah, I mean, I remember when the Great Muda came out, um, and NWA had more heat than when they when they presented Okada here. And they could have easily did that, even if they wanted to do the debut they did. The announcers could have said, here's Okada. He's had a pass with the Young Bucks. This is going to get ugly. They could have built that. Oh, my God. And they could have built that up with the heel turn. I think they think that they're too cool for school AEW. That they're, they want to cater to the hardcore fan yeah. that watches uh, New Power uh, Japan Pro Wrestling, right? Or Japan Pro Wrestling. Uh, and, and the, to be the inside guy, the wrestling geek, they, that's what they think of their fans. It, that our fans know everything that's going on everywhere when that's not the, the fact. There's fact that there's AEW fans, BJ, that know who these guys are, but they don't know their background. So you, when anytime there's a, a, a wrestling wrestler debuting, whether it's, that's one good thing about NXT, BJ is that when they go through NXT and then they go to the big, you know, the big time, one of the big two big shows, the wrestling audience for the most part knows who they are. And then the announcers explain Tiffany Stratton, former NXT title, right? They, they uh, Braun Breaker, 
NXT Tag Team Champion, and then they explain to you, and you know who they are. With this case, Tony Khan just assumed you're a super smart wrestling fan because you're watching AEW, and you have to know Okada was the sting of Japan. Well, I, that's the thing. I think part of it, when AEW started, most of the uh, uh, most of the wrestlers were uh, people, Arn Anderson, people, a uh, sting, people who they were already familiar with, CM Punk. So the assumption to continue to think that when you're bringing in new names and and no background, no narrative, no heat, nothing, just throw them into the ring. And even if you throw a mic on them, uh, people are still lost about w w w what are they talking about? What's the compelling narrative? And the announcers don't help. You're right, Tord. By, by you know, their job is to create the hype, create the excitement, and also tell us what the hell's going on. Uh, what all these narratives are uh, are conflating together. And, and it's time to switch up the announcers in AEW. That's one thing WWE's never been afraid of is to switch up the announcers. And if they don't work, they just move on. I mean, hey, no offense against Taz, but Taz has been doing this for 30 years. There's a reason why he's jumped around from TNA to WWE and now to AEW, right? Uh, Tony Schiavone is a is is a in ring, uh, behind the scenes guy. Tony Schiavone wasn't he's, he's even a that good. So, you know, he, yeah. he he's not a compelling personality. He's not a guy that's going to get the juices going. And Kevin Kelly, I know, is let go. I believe right by AEW. I think he got into some trouble, yeah. so he's not around to take over. But they need to find a new voice. Get rid of the mass, dude. Right? That's all. Yeah. And they need a new freshen up announce team. They yeah. really do. They need to freshen up because they're not doing a good job. I guess, though, to kind of wrap this up and not take too along with the Okada thing, I guess what, what the Young Bucks, and I kind of like what they're doing with the Young Bucks. The mm -hmm. Young Bucks fired Kenny Omega, suspended Hangman Page. When Omega's back, they could bring Hang – what they'll do is they'll bring back Hangman Page back from suspension. That means – Kenny will be back within a month. And then you have Abushi, the Golden Lover tag team with Omega. And I think he's hurt, correct? Yeah. So the Golden Lovers could come back with Hangman Page. And then that's your rivalry three on three that can kind of build from there, right? So that will kind of be the thing that they're doing from there. I liked what they did with the Eddie Kingston and bringing back Pac. Uh, I like that. I like the direction. I like the match. I like everything about it of what they're doing now. I just hate the debut of it. But I guess that was a week ago. You got to move forward and see what they do with it after that. So they failed on the intro. Let's see what they do moving forward. And, and, and one, one thing I think Khan is, you know, d does take into consideration is fans' reactions to certain things. I mean, and, and hence why partly he pivots so much, I think, is that if he takes negative heat on a few things, instead of just sticking down the path that he wants to go, he'll pivot. In this case, this could prove to be good that he's listening because I have not heard much fanfare across the board about the Okada um, uh, opening, particularly entering Okada in as a heel when he's traditionally been a, uh, a historic baby face in, uh, in New Japan. Yeah, it failed. But one thing that didn't fail, uh, Mercedes Monet, uh, yeah. Sasha Banks, good intro for her. You're seeing the women's division develop a little bit. You got Thunder Rosa and Deanna Perrazzo taking on Tony Storm and Mar uh, Mariah May. So you're starting to get the women's division in. I thought they did a very good job with Mercedes Monet and setting stuff up for her in the future. I think they did a really good job with that. She's going to be a huge star with the CEO stuff. Agreed. No, no. I, I, I think that this was an, a great move uh, by Tony and AEW. This is the kind of personality. This is the kind of energy and excitement that it's needed. It's bringing in sort of a fresh, uh, fresh energy to it, particularly now that the Sting narrative is done. Yeah. You know, a lot, a lot of I think eyeballs were watching. You know, I mean, like we talked about Sting '65. A lot of last year was the build up to his last match. They knew it was going to be the uh, the last year. So this was, you know, now that that chapter is closed, I think the Mercedes Monet and building up the women's division. Is probably AEW's best line right now, pending on what they do with Okada, to really create some stickiness to uh, uh, to to the AEW. Yeah, don't make, don't let the Tony Storm Monet rivalry go right away. I like that they're bringing Thunder Rosa back in the main storyline. It looks like she's healthier though. Let it breathe. Let everything breathe. In fact, uh, after uh, Re it's Rio, that's it. Uh, Monet's going to go after, correct? Yeah, that's what. Yep. After that, you got to bring Brett Breaker out. 
and Brett Baker wants a piece. And that's how you set it up and build it up. And then on the other end, you set up Tony Storm and Thunder Rosa, and then the winner of that will face the winner of, you know, a kind of they're they're building everything up. So just continue to do what they're doing there. Uh, did you think it was weird though? Uh, pretty good job by AEW to build up war a Wardlow again. Yeah. But I they do it for like three weeks and then he gets beat by Samoa Joe. They're doing two things. They're making Samoa Joe a fighting champ where he takes on everybody, which is good. It kind of Seth Rollins bit. working champ type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some some legitimate see to him because he is an older guy that he deserves it. But two, quick build and then fall down the cliff for Wardlow. And then you got to wonder what the hell they do with that guy again. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Where does he fit now in the narrative now Where's that he's... Built? Yeah, yeah. How does he rebuild? Because the heavy mic, the heavy... Um, uh, energy that this is my time uh, culminated into a loss to Samoa Joe. So where do you put him? Yeah. I mean, maybe he takes, uh, you know, freshly squeezed and goes for that title. Um, I just don't know where he goes after this. Well, and, the other uh, thing we know about AEW is that there's so many titles. They might even create one for him to create a, yeah. <laughs> a narrative for a, a narrative for him to chase. And I love the Osprey Daniel Bryan. I don't know is, is Osprey in the Callis family? They're just kind of left that hanging there. Yeah, they did not formally. Um, I know that Callis would want wants him in the family, and that was kind of an early narrative that Callis was talking about. But I, but it, but this week's AEW, I did not see any any conclusion on that. or mention. They just well, kind of yeah, let it I didn't die. See, not at all. Did they even have the Callis family there? No. Which is odd because I mean that at least I, mean, I think that adds another layer of characters and interesting intrigue to the story. Uh, by by bringing Callis and the Callis family in, but I didn't yeah. see any of that this week. It's just weird with AEW how you could get Callis family being hot on something, and then they're gone. Private Party comes back, they're gone. There's too many guys coming in and out without maintaining people, right? Well, and, and that's you know, Rampage or co Collision this weekend. Maybe they'll come back, but it's just the consistency and the continuity of their programming doesn't match. And I don't know if it's, if it is because they're, they pivot so quickly based upon fan reaction. So therefore the narrative's constantly getting changed, trying to perfect and give the people what they want. But I think what the people want is consistency. They want a consistent narrative. They want to be surprised, but it's got to fit within the context of the story. That's I, that's what I, WWE has done so well. That's what Vince McMahon understood. That's why he was successful in bringing all of the uh, 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 wrestling uh, regions together. The wrestling regions independently were similar to what AEW was. Sticks and Stones wrestling with limited um, uh, success of narratives that only had, a very, had only had a sliver of fans to be able to follow it. McMahon understood how to create the mass appeal, create the superstar, create the narrative around that superstar, and how you chase the belt. I'm not seeing that AEW. I'm seeing too many divisions, and I hope that... Uh, uh, Mr. Khan might be, you know, maybe tuning into uh, your uh, your podcast here, Gord, um, as a uh, as a voice talking about it, because I think that he has the financial wherewithal to build a successful product. I think there's a lane for it. There's no question. As the wrestling community grows and as more people get excited about wrestling in general, but he's got to he he he's got to stay consistent in order to grab in, in order to grab and grow that. Or remove himself as head of creative. That would probably be the best bet, right? Yeah. yeah I don't no, think things yeah. are going and, and, and There's talented straight. writers out there. Yeah. He needs I mean, to go. McMahon, McMahon was interesting when he was head of creative because he had grown up in the business. He understood yeah. the ins and outs. And then he, you know, inserted himself in the narrative. But but, but he was a, you know, he was an actor himself. I mean, he he, he was a great heel. He was uh, a great character. He was, he was a great character. And, and then know, I only it, wonder if the pervy Vince McMahon was a character. Yeah, well, they, they they say maybe he was acting out his, uh, you know, his subconscious self uh, <laughs> during yeah. those years. <laughs> if you're just tuning in, this is the OVE podcast, the Torque BJ Sugar of uh, the Ohio Athletic Commission, by the way. Every Thursday, the final segment of the show, we do wrestling. So kind of program that yourself for that. Right around 340, every Thursday, we do wrestling. Now with the new channel. Subscribe to the new channel, youtube.com forward slash at 
Ohio versus everyone. If you're a wrestling fan, BJ and I are going to do a WrestleMania show, maybe a post WrestleMania show after that. Maybe after the Raw WrestleMania, we give you a little Tuesday show, a wrestling show to kind of recap that Monday after WrestleMania is always the best one of the year. Yeah. So we're going to start throwing in specialty shows for some of the big events. SummerSlam. It looks like it's coming to Cleveland. We'll you know, it's official. It's, it's, it is? Okay. It's, it's locked in. It's locked it, and loaded. It, you can buy your tickets the already. <laughs> they want the tax break. We're going, toward. We're, we're going. going. I, I, dude, I'm in. They, uh, I mean, that's, it's a no-brainer. So if you're, the, you're a wrestling fan, there's no one in Ohio who's given you a wrestling podcast like we are. So subscribe to the new page. Uh, BJ, I'm going to keep this short here. And this is the reason why I'm going to. Okay? And I think I'm right on this. Houston hosted Raw, and I don't think in the history of Raw, I have experienced a lamer crowd than Houston that made every single segment of a show appear dead and on life support. It was awful. The show was awful, and the show was awful because the crowd gave nothing. I yeah, don't, I don't, I mean, I, I, am I wrong here? Or no, I mean, the performance sucked, or the crowd crowd was the worst thing I've ever seen. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what was what was going on that night because he, he, even Yeet, I mean, even the traditional um, energetic entrances were, were garnering a, a flat line, nothing. Um, I don't know. I, 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 you know, something was in the water maybe that day because it, that's the the or or maybe the narratives. I mean, if we look, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know how I felt about the um, a gauntlet match, right? Um, against Gunther, like we talked about last but week. But they know they weren't into anything, not any no. second, BJ, nothing. No, even Sami Zayn beats Gable at the end, right? I mean, Zayn usually exudes a great energetic uh, and, and nothing. I mean, he wins, and it's kind of like, you know, it, 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 that it was almost it, it was almost like uh, the crowd uh, was just willing its way through the three hours. Yeah, it just, it the Nia Jax, Becky Lynch, they're setting that up to build up Becky. They have to. They have to build up Becky because it wasn't, it's not one of these pushes, BJ, where Becky's been pushed since SummerSlam in this. She lost to Nia Jax right before the pay-per-view. They built up Nia for that big elimination chamber match over Becky. Now I think they need to come in and have Becky beat Nia. They had Becky beat uh, Liv, uh, Liv Morgan to yeah. kind of give her a big push. And then she's got a channel main event in Raw, beat Nia Jax once and for all, and do it decisively to kind of give her that. It was real. It was just a really messed up Raw because even didn't you think the Drew, Drew McIntyre Seth Rollins where Seth is like daring him to hit him? I just thought it was. I thought that segment was weak. But even the you're right about the intro. They weren't into Seth's intro. They always are. They weren't into Cody Rhodes. No, right? Every and even the yeet, is. the yeet with uh, Uso was uh, was weak. I mean, he, I mean, he had to actually try to coach the crowd to get into it, which it, which never happens. Yeah, I just thought it, it. That's why it's such a tough raw to put your he head around because I thought the crowd sucked so bad. And I think sometimes these wrestlers will tell you they feed off the crowd. Yeah, and the crowd sucked. So you go out and you just perform to the best of your ability and do it. If I am WWE and Triple H. I take a look at Houston and say, all right, they will never get a Raw or a SmackDown while there is a big pay-per-view coming up. If they're you know, the fascinating in, part they, was, they it lost like, it to me. They should and, never and, get and, one. And the, and the arena was packed. I mean, it, it, was. it wasn't like it was, I mean, the, 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 the arena was at, at capacity. Yep. But so I, 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 I don't understand why it, uh, why it ended up like that. If there's a fast lane in the future, you can have it the night after fast lane but you will never get a pay-per-view on the road to WrestleMania. It really was one of the worst WrestleManias I've seen. And it's direct segments weren't the best, but I think that crowd really sucked. And something happened to the R-Truth one. He came out and then the uh, video was up and then all of a sudden like went to commercial. I, I didn't, and I didn't catch what, 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 what that was about. Did you? No, I really wish they would do more with, uh, our truth and the judgment day instead of making it a squash match every time. Yeah, yeah, they've got to figure that one out. You they know. should have. They should have let this breathe a little bit more. It was funny. It was great. Now our truth, hopefully, reinvents himself some way because well, again, our truth kind of playing a, almost a mental patient to a certain degree, which I'm, I'm, I'm I, you know, I mean, I, I, I love the fact of being sort of the ignorant, um, negligent idiot. Well, that's his with, thing. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah, I like that with the Judgment Day, but the. I don't. I, I'm not buying this uh, amnesia type role that he's having 
with Miz and the crew, calling him a different name. At least for me, that's not as appealing as was when he came in trying to give uh, you know, Damian Priest his cut of the uh, T-shirts. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yep. Good stuff on the chats, though. I'm glad uh, people are doing wrestling, man. Let's get the super chats going, though, next time. No, look, hey, I mean, Ohio, you know, the one thing about Ohio, Ohio versus everyone, Ohio, uh, we consistently host Raw. You know, one of the few states in the country, Toledo, Columbus, Cincinnati, Cleveland. You've got all those municipalities that support it. We've got SummerSlam coming. You know, is this summer, first time since 1996. So I think the heat's only going to keep getting turned up here, and we keep turning out stars. Logan Paul, The Miz, Nick Nemeth. I mean, j- j- just to name a few um, uh, that are, you know, from Ohio. Yeah. Good stuff, BJ. We'll do it again next uh, next Thursday. We'll do you it again. It. Looking we'll forward to our, it, Lord. Yep. We'll do our special WrestleMania show as well, where we do every single segment. We'll give you an hour preview of WrestleMania coming up. So remember, every single Thursday, right around 340-ish, we give you one segment of wrestling a week, right? Warforyou.com. I want you to go there. And then uh, we're, we're going to get it going. We're building this, man. We want to get the wrestling fans out there. So if you are a wrestling fan or know someone who's a wrestling fan, tell them about the OVE podcast. We will break it down for you. We appreciate George, it. I, I think one of these days, I think when Raw comes in, I think we reach out. I think we can get a wrestler on. I, I think we can get you know a, a, a one-on-one with some of these guys and, and, and chop it up. I'm buddies with Vic Joseph. I'll ask Vic if he'll come on. Yeah, I mean, that would be that would be great. Yep, I work with Vic in Cleveland. He's, you know, not Vic Joseph, but I mean, he's Vic Joseph. So uh, <laughs> I'll ask Vic to come on here in the next couple of weeks. Maybe we'll talk WrestleMania with him. All right, have a good night, everybody. We'll talk to you tomorrow on the OVA podcast.